first of all, I'd also like to wel welcome uh, everyone here today and, and uh, thank you very much for being here and, and spending your Saturday with us. We actually really enjoy doing this and really appreciate the relationships that we have um, with a vast majority of our audience today and helping take care of uh, our, our patients, your patients, and the community um, both here and, and not too far away um, together, so thank you. Um, so today, the, the, the name of my talk is Bees Knees, and I really don't have any idea what that means. Car Car Carly asked me what I was going to talk on, and I said, I have no idea, so that's what she named my, my talk. So, so if you've been wondering what it means, I don't know. Um, and as we go through this, I know uh, Dr. Shaw is going to talk um, later uh, today about, uh, or later this morning, about what can go wrong with rotator cuff repairs. Um, I'm really going to talk about ACL surgery and what can go wrong. And, and I want to make it pretty informal. I'm happy to trudge through it, but if you have questions as we go through it, raise your hand and we can stop and uh, talk about it as we go. Um, so what can go wrong with your ACL surgery? Um, the answer is quite a few things. Um, so first of all, let's talk about um, anatomy, and if we uh, look at the anatomy of the knee, um, not to get too um, laborious about it, but the, the anterior cruciate ligament is one of the cruciate ligaments that cross in the middle of the knee. And so it's this ligament right here. Um, the posterior cruciate ligament is in the back and it acts incredibly different when it's injured compared to the anterior cruciate ligament. But anterior cruciate ligament tears Although partial ACL tears do exist, I think they're relatively rare. Um, and there's a uh, um, lot of different ways to attack ACL surgery, and even there's a new um, interest in, in repairing ACL injuries. And really what that tells you is there's a lot of problems in dealing with this particular injury and getting athletes back uh, to um, full activities and weekend warriors back to full activities without having problems. Um, so it's a ligament that has a very uh, tenuous blood supply. It's not a good healer by nature. Um, it's a ligament that uh, we need for aggressive cutting and pivoting, change of direction things. So lots of people can live without an ACL, um, but if you're going to be real active and do a lot of aggressive cutting and pivoting, um, your knee's probably going to be healthier and, you, and more trustworthy if you do have a functioning ACL. But it's a poor healer, so the vast majority of people who tear an ACL, if they don't do anything surgically for it, um, they're going to have an ACL deficient knee, um, which for many people is okay, but uh, again, it can lead to other problems if uh, they're too active and they have recurrent instability. I tell patients, you really have two options because the goal after an ACL tear is to not have recurrent instability episodes because that will damage other structures in the knee and um, it's annoying. Um, but you can either modify your activity so you're not um, pushing that threshold to have those giving out episodes or we fix you. So that's the ligament we're talking about. This is kind of how these ligaments often look after uh, they're torn and you get in there and you can see that they really, um, it almost looks as though they explode. Um, some of them don't and they just kind of tear off the bone and they look pretty healthy. They just get disconnected, but this is a very common presentation after an ACL tear. Okay, so what, what can go wrong with the, um, if you decide to get your ACL fixed? Um, number one, stiffness is probably the most common problem and and it's a, a, an evil problem, and we'll, we'll dive more into that as we go through this, but if you get an ACL fixed and you get stiff, a lot of times those patients would like to have their loose knee back, um, and they don't have that opportunity. So stiffness is probably, in my mind, the mo most evil of the problems or the things that can go wrong with an ACL reconstruction. Um, graft failure, graft failures are, are all too common. Um, if you look up the literature and you try to, to dive into, okay, how common are these? Really, you have a hard time finding good literature, and, and there's probably several reasons. Um, 
we're finding more literature about pediatric patients, but um, there's probably a lot of reasons. One is that a lot of patients are lost to follow up when, by the time they get to a point where they re-injure themselves. Two, most physicians don't love um, airing their dirty laundry. Um, but I think overall, I think the failure rate with ACL surgery is much, much higher than we appreciate. Um, and, and certainly, um, trying to uh, find ways to maximize uh, the longevity of these graphs is something that there's gonna be more and more emphasis on as we go through. But the failure rates, I mean, I tried to look this up and, and you can find places that estimate that perhaps even up to 25 to 30% of all ACL reconstructions that sometimes fail. I don't know if that's true. Um, I think in certain populations it's probably true, uh, but the failure rate's much higher than uh, we like to admit. Uh, meniscal tears down the road are also uh, common complications, and we won't spend a lot of time talking about those, but we are going to talk some about arthritis and what are the things that can lead to arthritis because this is a common pathway after an ACL as well. And quite frankly, when we fix an ACL, we're trying to prevent arthritis, and in some cases, I think the reconstruction actually makes the incidence of arthritis higher. Stiffness is the worst. Um, a stiff knee doesn't feel normal, and um, most people that are stiff would tell you they will take anything back if they could have anything but a stiff knee. Um, stiffness, uh, um, in my book, is defined as, as anything um, where you lose two degrees of hyperextension, is, and that's an important thing to distinguish here is you know, two degrees or more of hyperextension loss, in my mind, is the loss of motion after an ACL reconstruction. That's enough to make you feel very abnormal and probably to change the pressures that are going on in your joint. Um, and that's, that's uh, a, a common uh, problem or loss of five degrees or more of flexion. Arthrofibrosis is a fancy word that means stiffness, and this is, this is kind of how it's defined. This is Shelbourne's classification of arthrofibrosis following um, surgery, and, and this is, it, this, the only reason I bring this up is this is kind of how we classify them when we're treating them, and, and, and it kind of just tells you the severity. Type 1 is really just a loss of extension, but not too crazy much. They're not, it's less than 10 degrees. Type 2 loss of extension, flexion's pretty good, but more than 10 degrees, that's, that's pretty disabling right there. Once you get in, type ones are disabling, type twos are really disabling, and then when you get into type three and type four, those are, those are catastrophic losses of motion um, that can be very difficult to uh, uh, regain. But type three is greater than 10 degrees of hyperextension plus greater than 25 degrees loss of flexion. And then type fours are the ones that are, that are god awful. Um, they're super stiff, their patellas are stuck down. Um, that's the knee that looks like it's been poured into cement. So why is stiff bad? Well, first of all, it feels abnormal. Um, it uh, leads to increased joint pressures um, and probably much more than appreciated stiff, uh, you know, back, back when I was a resident, which, um, was a long time ago, we used to talk about uh, shoulder arthritis and that the most common reason for people to have shoulder arthritis, we felt, was that they had surgery and became stiff and it changed the pressures. I think the same thing happens in the knee. If you have surgery in the knee and you lose motion, it changes your contact pressures and probably puts you more at risk for arthritis. Um, and we definitely have increased anterior knee pain. Uh, back in 92, um, Shelbourne and I actually published a study um, on anterior knee pain following ACL reconstructions and it was very clear that, an that anterior knee pain was directly related to a loss of motion and sometimes very subtle loss of motion and extension. So why do patients develop arthrofibrosis? So if we look at, if we look at ACL reconstructions and you're getting your ACL fixed, what are the things that we can do um, to prevent it, and why do patients who get ACL reconstructions get stiff? Well, I think it's multifactorial. I think if you really look at um, ACL reconstructions and, and what you can do uh, 
to prevent it, you have to look at three different phases. What happens after the injury, but before surgery, the preoperative preparation or rehabilitation. What happens in the operating room, which unfortunately therapists can't control and, and hopefully the, the physician is, is putting the graft in the right place and tensioning it, but uh, that's, that's a common problem. Um, and then what you do afterwards, how you rehabilitate them afterwards. All those things are important. And I can't say that one is more important than the other. If you operate on a stiff knee, chances are much higher that you're gonna end up with a stiff knee. Um, if you put a graft in, a, in the wrong place or tension it inappropriately, chances are you're gonna end up with knee stiffness. If you don't do the appropriate post-operative rehab, chances are you're gonna end up with knee stiffness. So preoperatively, what are the goals? Well, I think there's two goals preoperatively. I don't worry too much about swelling. Some patients, particularly if they have a chondral injury or associated meniscal tear, they stay swollen um, and it's hard to get rid of that. But it's very important that you have a restoration um, or they regain full range of motion. Now, truthfully, I'll fudge a little bit with the flexion if they're having a hard time getting all their flexion back. Um, I can live with that, but their extension needs to be good. If you operate on a knee that doesn't go straight as the other knee, you're asking for trouble. Um, and then also, there's a lot more talk around ACLs as to, you know, um, we call it a double insult, but there's some studies coming out of Boston that are showing the inflammatory response in the synovium or the lining of the joint after an injury and the number of cells, they're called macrophages, that indicate uh, this level of inflammation in the joint is very high um, after an ACL reconstruction. And in animals, the patients who, or the, the animals who have surgery afterwards, um, if those macrophages haven't resolved, which usually takes about three to four weeks, uh, their, their chance of getting stiffness and their chance of getting arthritis seems higher. So those are all basic study si uh, studies, but I think ultimately we're gonna find that getting past that acute inflammatory phase is pretty important. So we're gonna dive into a little bit of the graft positioning and tensioning, and this is the, uh, this is the surgery part. And, and, and in my mind, this is the bottom is how we want the new ACL to look when we're done. This is a ACL reconstruction we performed a couple weeks ago, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about um, why it's difficult to get this graft exactly where we want it. It seems like it should be a simple thing, but, it, but it's more complex than we like to admit sometimes. Here's a, here's a picture again of how this graft should set. So ultimately, this graft um, or your ACL is gonna, going to lie directly under the roof, the roof of, the, of the femur, so up in here, is you got this notch that the ACL runs through and when you straighten your knee out, that graft should lie right up against that line that we call Blumenstadt's line. Um, but it's very important that the graft be as anatomic as possible and we're gonna talk about why that's a misnomer. Um, and you need to know how to tension it and make sure that we're, we're not putting a graft in too tight or too loose. And in my mind, too tight's way worse than too loose. Um, but um, anatomic, so anatomic probably came about when we started talking about the anatomy um, of the ACL. We'll stay with this slide for a second. So the anatomy of the ACL, and, and I didn't want to dive into this, but truthfully, the anatomy is two bundles. So, so the way God puts it together, we have an anterior medial and a posterior lateral bundle, and one's tight in extension, one's tight in flexion. And, and so Freddie Fu, um, probably a couple decades ago, started talking about we should be reconstructing these with two bundles. We should be putting two grafts in, okay? Um, I had a hard time jumping into that because I thought it just gave us an opportunity to not put one bundle in the wrong spot, but to put two bundles in the wrong spot and uh, to have more problems. And that, and that really is what uh, turned out to be true. Right now, I think there's very little talk around double bundle ACL reconstructions. Um, although I think someday that may return. Um, but right now, um, that's not the case. So we talk about an anatomic ACL, 
but we're really putting one bundle or we're putting one graph in a spot that really is designed to have two. So you, it's a misnomer because you can't put one bundle in, in the perfect spot because it doesn't exist, okay, um, with one bundle. You would have to do two bundles to do that. And you have to make sure that you don't over tension it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So, so the concept of four bar linkage is really key to, to getting an ACL graft in, the, in an appropriate position. And really what it, it's defined, um, and I won't belabor this too much, but it's defined by the ACL and the PCL. And they cross in the middle of the knee and the central axis of rotation of the knee runs through this intersection, okay? So that's, that's how the ACL, for the most part, stays pretty much the same length throughout the full range of motion and how the PCL stays pretty much the same length throughout full range of motion is it goes through that central axis of rotation or at least it's very close. So you can see the di diagram over there, just, and that's a schematic, it's not very accurate, but ideally you want your ACL graph to pass through that axis of rotation so that the length of your, your tunnels or the distance of your tunnels doesn't differ a lot because if you have a graph that lays below this axis, it's going to be tight in extension and it's gonna be loose in flexion. If you have it in front, it's gonna be tight in flexion and it's gonna be loose in extension. So, so it becomes very hard to tension that graph. So um, let's go back to this for a second here. Um, so if you end up with a, a graph, in, and we'll come down the road, I think I have a picture where there's a lot of emphasis talking about anatomic positioning and getting that graft as low in the notch as you can. But then if you tension the graft in anything but full extension, you're gonna make it too tight. Um, Post-operative rehabilitation, um, emphasis on full range of motion, and we're very neurotic about this for the first couple weeks, particularly hyperextension. So really the therapy needs to be focused on not allowing patients to develop problems instead of trying to undo them after they've developed. So we're going to have early emphasis on um, early range of motion, um, and then we want to pre prevent these problems from developing and try to limit um, activities as much as we can, which is the key to controlling the swelling. So just remember, stiff is worse than loose. We can fix loose. If you have a re-rupture, we can usually deal with that. Um, Stiffness is very difficult. So how do we treat stiffness? Well, um, if you have a patient who's stiff and the, stiffer, the more stiff they are, the more difficult it is to treat them. But what we'll do is, is first of all, I think there's two components to stiff. One is, is you usually have something in the front of the knee um, that's blocking their motion because they haven't gotten their knee straight for a long time. They develop scar tissue in the front of their knee um, they may have a graft that's over tensioned. Um, if they have a graft that was tightened, you know, there's a lot of tendency um, for people that go through ACL or that do ACL reconstructions. If you don't know where you are in relationship to that axis of rotation, you pull down on the graft, you put a screw in, and if it's too tight, they struggle with their motion. We usually blame that on the therapist, but, but truth is, is the therapist has, has no chance. <laughs> Hopefully I never blame anything on the therapist, but, but truthfully, um, I mean, all the therapists who take care of, of this or know what I'm talking about, but if the graft is too tight, that's a problem. So um, first of all, um, we gotta deal with what happens in the front of the knee. Second of all, if you haven't gotten your knee straight for a long time, your capsular structures become tight. So you can, you can scope these patients and ultimately, um, they don't get much better because you've only taken care of one, one problem and that's trying to deal with the scar tissue that's in the front of the knee. So you can, you can take out the scar, but if you don't put them in extension cast, which is really miserable, I'm telling you, those patients stay overnight because they usually want to shoot me if they see me because it hurts. But you have to find a way to stretch the posterior capsule. So we put them in extension cast. 
um, and they keep them there for about a week because that's about all they need. But that's the key to getting back as much of their hyperextension as they can. Um, prevention is the key. Trying to undo this is difficult. It's miserable for patients. Um, it's, just, it's just not much fun. And even a loss of two degrees of extension um, can really make a difference on how you feel. You never feel normal and how you function. So now let's talk about graft failures, okay? So that's the, the second thing that can happen. And this is kind of an interesting um, progression um, as we move forward, which we'll talk about. And, and I think graft failures are, first of all, we have to put the graft in the right place. We have to rehab them appropriately. Um, we have to tension the graft appropriately. I mean, if you over-tension a graft, you have two options that, or two things that can happen. Your patient can get stiff or they have to stretch the graft out to get their motion back. Both are bad. Stiff is the worst, but if you stretch your graft out, you're definitely changing this maturation process where you're changing the tendon to a ligament, which is a cool process, but you're affecting that if you, if you have to stretch a graft out. And, and patellar tendon grafts in particular are probably very difficult to, to stretch out. Um, and then your graft choice. Your graft choice is important to graft failures. So graft choices, and again, we could spend a whole talk talking about these, but allografts are really gentle, but they have a much higher failure rate, particularly in an active population. I use them, but we use them in, in a group that's um, a little bit more, um, less aggressive, let's say, they're older patients. Um, hamstring grafts, ha hamstring grafts became very uh, popular probably 10 to 15 years ago, and they're, and they're losing some of their favor, so back 10, 15 years ago, the, the thinking was anything we can find graft-wise that's um, less traumatic or presents less morbidity, um, the better. Um, hamstring grafts are all soft tissue. You have a much better chance of stretching that graft out if it's not perfectly positioned. Um, so I think hamstring grafts um, are, are becoming less popular because I think the general consensus is that they tend to stretch out some um, and the failure rate's a little higher. Um, patellar tendons have always been the gold standard, but now we're moving towards a transition and you're hearing a lot more about quadriceps tendon grafts. Quad tendon grafts are, are fabulous grafts, um, but they're, they're not a, a benign graft. Um, patients take a long time to get their strength back, um, so, but it's a very robust graft, but we're using them much, much more um, in one particular patient population, um, and I think it's gonna, uh, it's gonna improve our failure rate, but it's also a um, much more difficult graft to rehab for the therapist. It's a much more difficult graft to appropriately um, place and tension, um, and it takes a long time to get your strength back. Um, so wh what group is most at risk for failures? Young people. I mean, the patients who are 16 and younger definitely have a much higher failure rate. Um, you know, uh, initially, in the super young that have open growth plates, they were talking about how these epiphyseal sparing procedures that were not the typical reconstructions had such a high failure rate. I, I, I'm not sure it was the procedure. I just think 10 and 11 and 12 year olds that tear ACLs are, are nightmares in keeping things together down the road. There's a reason they tore their ACL when they were 11 and 12. Um, sex, um, young females have a much higher recurrence rate than young males, and, and I'm not really sure why. I, again, that goes into the same concept of why young female basketball players have a higher rate of ACL tears than, than males. Um, males have this thing called football that tend to kind of even the playing field out, but, but uh, females are more at risk for graft failure. Activity level, the more aggressive, you know, sports like basketball and soccer certainly have higher failure rates. Um, and then return, uh, early return to full activities. I mean, typically, if a patient uh, has re regained enough uh, strength and they look good, we'll start running and jogging and doing some of this return to play proprioception work with them at four months. Um, but we know, even though, you know, kind of the, the, the thought is, hey, at six months, we're gonna let you start going back and doing things. 
Um, we know that if we can get you to nine months, your chances of getting hurt go down compared to six months and 12 months, they go down compared to nine months and et cetera, et cetera. Um, certainly, the more aggressive we are at letting young athletes go back, um, the more likely they are to be injured. So keys to avoiding graft uh, um, failure is making the right graft choice, which sometimes is difficult. Um, typically speaking, I don't use any hamstring grafts anymore. Um, I use some allografts in the older, less demanding patients. Um, the gold standard for the majority of people for me is still a uh, patellar tendon graft, although um, more at risk patients that are super aggressive um, and younger patients in particular were using quadriceps tendon grafts. Um, and it, uh, it's by far the meanest graft. These patients do not recover as quick, but I'm kind of okay with that because I'm not in a hurry for this group to get back and do things. Return to play, this is something that, again, we could spend a whole talk uh, around return to play. Um, proprioception training is important and going through the right things. And this is, there's really a, 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 um, a gap, I think. I mean, we're, we're really good about early rehabilitation. Uh, in fact, I was at a wedding with Brad and Chrissy Ott, who, Brad's over here, so it made me think of this. And I was talking to Chrissy about we need to develop more of this return to play program because patients tend to disappear as they're going through this return to play program. And, and, and part of it's because insurance stops paying for their therapy, and, and, but really this is, this is an area that we have to get better at um, to try to decrease the number of re-injuries we have. There needs to be a progression of functional activities. You can't go from riding the bike to playing full court basketball in, in three weeks, that just doesn't work. Um, and then the time from surgery is also important like we talked about. Um, meniscal tears, I won't, I'm getting towards the end of my time, so I'm not gonna talk much about these, but just know that even if you have clean meniscus at the time of your ACL reconstruction, you have an increased risk of having a meniscal tear at some point in your life because the meniscus got beat up as well. Um, and then certainly if you had an ACL reconstruction and you had a repair, you have an increased risk that that repair will either not heal or at some point will be a recurrent tear. Arthritis, and this is the last thing I'm gonna talk about, and again, I think this is an underappreciated um, part of, of tearing your ACL, is one, there's a tra trauma to your, your knee, which a trauma alone increases your general risk of osteoarthritis tenfold. Now, if you have an ACL reconstruction, when I was young, I used to think, people would say, hey, if you have your ACL fixed, it increases your chances of arthritis. And I, and I, I was naive enough to tell people, that's ridiculous. Um, if you have it fixed, it decreases your risk. I'm not sure that's not true. But now, as you start thinking about this, I go, certainly if you have a knee that's loose and you have recurrent instability and you tear a meniscus and damage cartilage, that's not good and it leads to arthritis but stiffness probably is much more evil and, and how it relates to arthritis and how it uh, relates to joint pressures than we've appreciated. Um, obviously, instability and meniscal tears um, are also an issue. Um, but the key is, 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 is as, as hard as we try, we're not always gonna do this, but we need to try to get things right the first time, which means we need to get patients appropriately rehab before we fix them. We need to fix them with an appropriately placed graft and tensioned graft. And I emphasize the word tension. You can't put it in too tight. And, and, and there's a lot that goes into making sure that we do that right. And putting the gr right graft for that patient in and then doing the appropriate rehab and then transitioning them back to, to play um, in a logical, um, pattern which will differ for every patient so and thank you and are there any questions okay that was easy <laughs> thank you very much